thank you, thank you very much indeed for, for the introduction and the um, invitation to speak. Um, good evening, welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, maybe I thought actually before I start, I can you know, give a little bit of background just because I was talking about African languages. Um, my own background also, I didn't start off as an Africanist, I started studying English back in Germany, so my background is German. Um, so I was studying at Hamburg University in the English department. I did philosophy, but I felt that that was very Eurocentric, um, and then wanted to expand a little bit. So one one beginning of the semester, I started to learn Arabic, Indonesian, Japanese, and Swahili for non-European languages, with the view of only continuing one. But I, you know, there wasn't a particular preference, um, and I ended up with Swahili because I liked my teacher, I liked the fellow students, I liked the program which was embedded. And then slowly, slowly, um, work on African languages then became more important for what I'm doing. And then, you know, a good 20 years ago, I moved from, from Germany to London to the School of Writing African Studies, uh, which, is, you know, which is a good place to do African languages. Um, yeah, I want to talk about the, the big titles grant, universality and variation in language, but then I focus very much on the, on the case study of Eastern African languages languages we worked um, in London with colleagues also here in Ghent and in, in East Africa um, and present some, some research results. Um, I wasn't entirely sure about your background. Um, so I have slides, I have a wider, more of a historical situation, maybe a historical background where this research is coming from. Um, less so maybe in terms of methodology. So if there's anything which, you know, where you have a pressing question, just raise your hand and ask and we can do that quickly. Um, and then along the way, I can maybe point out what, what the important concepts are. Um, actually, if I speak without the microphone, can you hear me? It's just because then I don't have to do. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the world's linguistic complexity as a background, um, and then focus on approaches to this complexity and variation within linguistics. Then provide a bit of the background on Bantu languages, um, I introduce a particular tool we have developed over the last couple of years I'm really excited about, which is the Bantu Morphosyntactic Variation Database. So it's an electronic database where we have a bunch of languages and data, and that's what I use then for my analysis later. You're okay with morphology and syntax? That's good, because that is important later. Also in contradistinction to, to lexicon and phonology, because I compare two different you know, comparative approaches to a bunch of languages one based on lexicon and phonology, the other on morphosyntax, so that, that's important. Um, so this is what I'm doing then with the comparing East African languages, lexical and morphosyntactic groupings, um, and then I draw out final remarks and conclusions at the end. Um, this is by way of introduction background, this is from the Ethnolog, one of the main um, websites many people use to get a sense of the linguistic complexity and the world's languages, um, and that's um, gives figures. This is 2013, and the other thing I should say, this is number of languages, but of course you know that counting languages is really difficult and it's riddled with lots of problems. So we have to take that with a bit of a grain of salt, but what the ethno gives us is that uh, there are about 2,000 languages spoken in Africa, about 1,000 in America, 2,000 in Asia, 200 in Europe, and about 1,000 in Pacific. So the number of languages in the world, they estimate, is about 7,105. Um, and I have that also in the pie chart, you can see that the bulk of languages spoken are found in Africa and Asia, about a third each, um, and in other parts less. Um, this, is, this is first language or home language, which is another slightly complicated notion. And in particular, in terms of Europe, it doesn't, it doesn't include community languages. That is, you know, languages which came more recently to Europe, like you know, Turkish, for example, or Greek in, in London. Polish is very big in England. Uh, but that would include those other languages. Um, this is a map representation of linguistic complexity. So this is a map of the world, and the orange dots, each orange dot is a language, or a variety, if you like. And you can see that, that there's a difference if you look at the distribution. And in particular, there is a high distribution of languages, you know, lots of linguistic variation, in a center belt sort of across the equator, this part here. So Indonesia, Papua New Guinea are very, very linguistically complex. Also West Africa, Nigeria, you can see there. Um, and the part of the, of the world I'm going to look at, and look at this, I guess, um, is East Africa here. There's also quite a bit of 
of language learning basically. Um, I should say a little bit, that, you know, I won't say much more than that, but I should say a little bit about language endangerment, um, which you may have come across. There is lots of worries in the linguistics community, and has been for some decades now, um, on the rapid loss of linguistic diversity. We have many, many social linguistic situations where speakers move away from smaller community languages to a wider language, a language of wider communication, a big national language or even an international language. Um, and many, you know, many speakers and linguists are worried about that. This is from the BBC. This is already from 2009. Um, and it says that an estimated 7,000 languages have been spoken about the world. That's the figure we've just seen. Um, but the number is expected to shrink rapidly in the coming decades. And then they ask, what is lost when a language dies? And there's a whole discourse on language endangerment, which we can talk about a little bit later. Partly why I'm saying that, because at, at my university, at, at SOAS, we have an electronic archive of endangered languages. So this is the website here, um, and I don't, you know, you know, I can't even read it terribly well, but it sort of says that the archive is there to preserve um, endangered languages, to provide structures, and also that it's freely and openly accessible. You will have to register because of access and, and copyright issues, but otherwise it's a database which is there for everybody to use. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of thing, endangered languages, you know, language variation, language varieties which are not easily accessible, this is a really good, um, great resource. Um, but I don't think I have much more tonight on endangered languages. Um, the other resource I briefly want to introduce, just again as way of background, is the World Atlas of Language Structures, or WALLS, which is a big, big electronic database. Um, it's based on about, I think, about 200 grammatical features of you know, ever so many languages giving information about how that language deals with case, passive, you know, the vowel, vowel inventory, all kinds of grammatical features. Um, so the example I have here is on, on, the, on the presence of tone systems, so the, the use of pitch to distinguish meaning, if you like. And you can see again, the complexity very much resides around the equator. Um, and so this is the world atlas, and there's, you know, if you Google it, it's easy to find. Um, so this is the wider, wider background on the variation. Um, I now want to look a little bit at approaching to understanding or studying or investigating diversity and variation. Um, and I think I have four subheadings. It's, it's very historical. I, you know, I think you probably are familiar with it, but, um, but we can look at it briefly. Um, so I start with two linguists, Joseph Greenberg and Noam Chomsky. You've come across either of them, both of them? Um, so they were, you know, they were in many ways defining for the disciplines, both of them worked in the 50s and 60s, and in many ways our discourses are still framed in, in these terms. Um, so, so the questions people ask in the language universals, and including these linguists, um, is on the one hand, what do all human languages have in common, and or what defines the class of human languages? Are there other languages we would think of? anywhere from computer languages, which are also languages in sense, but very different from human languages, to things like Klingon or, you know, invented languages. And people are interested about what the class of human languages is. Um, so Greenberg, one of his main, main contributions is, is to the study of language universals, uh, where he has statements saying that if a language has a feature X, that is nominative case, it will also always, or with great likelihood, have a feature Y that is accusative case. And he has lots of statements along those lines to get a sense of how languages are different and similar. Um, Chomsky's approach is slightly different, but sort of linked. And the main concept I think Chomsky has developed is the notion of universal grammar, where he proposed that humans, human beings, are biologically endowed with the blueprint for language. And because of that cognitive or psychological even endowment, human languages are of a particular kind. Um, that's the universal part. Typology is linked to that. And the typo a typologist would ask, how, how do languages differ? What are the parameters of variation in natural language? And I use the notion of parameter later on in the bunch of context as well. Um, so that has a longer tradition even. That goes back to the 19th century. Um, Wilhelm von Humboldt is often credited by distinguishing languages, the morphological type of languages, between isolating, agglutinating, and synthetic languages. It's not terms I'm going to use very much later. The Bantu languages we're going to look at in that typology are agglutinating languages. Um, you have come across isolating, agglutinating? It's, 
Yeah, it's maybe no longer part of the core linguistics, uh, but it's still for the foundation of the discipline is important. It's for, for what I have later, I don't think it matters, but we can look at agglutinating a little bit later when I have examples. Um, and more recently, people like, like Matthew Dreyer have looked at word order topology for <coughs> distinguishing between subject verb object, um, SVO, SOV, VSO, VOSO, SV, and OBS languages. Um, this is a, a picture of, of Humboldt. I don't have much more to say about Humboldt at this stage. Um, but I have a little bit more on word order topology. So this is more recent work by, uh, by a colleague called Harald Hammerström. Um, and he has worked on a sample of 5,000 languages, which gets quite close to really having a significant proportion of the world's languages. Um, and then it gets more complicated if you look at the details, but one of the results he has is that the vast majority of languages have either subject object verb order or subject subject verb object order. And with Bantu later on, we look at, at subject verb object order. Um, that's the typology background, I'm happy with that. Um, I want now to move on to language change and language contact, which takes us even <coughs> further back in time. So actually we could, you know, we could get back further to classics, but in a, in a modern sense, I want to start in the 18th century with William Jones in 16, 16, uh, 1768, where he observes that Sanskrit, Latin and Greek are related, and he observes that because he was an English civil servant working in India, um, and it was the engagement with texts in Sanskrit where he thought he knew Latin and Greek, where he, where he was struck by that similarity. Um, and what is interesting is that A, he was struck by the similarity, and B, his mode of explanation was a historical. He said, well, this similarity we explained by postulating that at some point in the past, these languages were spoken by one group of people, which was very much in the spirit of the time. History was seen you know, much of the 18th and 19th century as a key explanatory parameter. And so you have that also in Hegel and later on in Marx, where Marx's theory is very much historical based. So this is part of that intellectual landscape. Um, then, you know, a hundred years later, we have the, the, the Jung Grammatiker, or the Neogrammarians, a bunch of, of linguists working around Leipzig, maybe that was the main university. Um, and in the famous text, Osthoff and Brugmann write that sound changes regular, that is sound loss, Lautgesetze at the time, determine linguistic change. And in contradistinction to that, that you know, there was criticism very early on, and people like, like Schmidt and Schuchardt, also still in the 19th century, say, well, yes, maybe, but there's also something which they call the wave theory of language change, which works slightly differently. I have more on that because it's important for what I say later. Um, this is William Jones again, just a picture of what he looked like, so you can really see we're 18th century now. Um, this is a copy of the of the Osthoff Bruckmann, the Morphologische Untersuchung auf dem Wieder in Grammatischen Sprachen. It's a little bit, it's the manifesto of the Neogrammarians. So they write, erstens, first of all, aller Lautwandel, soweit er mechanisch vor sich geht, vollzieht sich nach ausnahmslosen Gesetzen. Every, you know, first of all, Every, ch every sound change, every change in, in sound, in language sound, as long as it, as it proceeds mechanically, proceeds along, along laws which are exceptionist. There is no exception to these sound laws. It was a very strong statement and wanted to bring linguistics and achieved to bring linguistics much closer to the natural sciences where people had developed laws of, of you know, you know, gr gravity and stuff, away from the humanities. And it, you know, it's still very much with us today to have, we have the ambiguity of linguistics between a more interpretive, qualitative approach from the humanities and the more quantitative, you know, experimental approach on, from the sciences. Um, the family tree was an outcome of that. You've seen family trees. This is a family tree of the Indo-Germanic languages. It comes from John's observation of the relation and the exceptionlessness of sound laws of the young grammarians. Um, which brought us to this stage. Um, in contrast to this, the wave theory has a slightly different approach to language change. It's more like you know, every innovation is studied in itself. Um, the family tree takes its, its, its metaphor, if you like, from biology. Essentially, the big problem, if you like, with the family tree is that it treats languages as people. So if you think of a family tree, you have a parent generation, a mother and a father, and then children, offspring, aunts. But all these, all these nodes in the tree are organisms. They, they have a lifespan. They get born, they die. 
That's not quite true of languages, because languages change gradually from one to the other. So there is an, there is an imbalance in this metaphor of this, of this tree. Um, it crucially assumes divergence of language, that is, language split over time and become more different. That's, that's inherent in that model. Um, it assumes that speech communities split, that is, some speakers move away, and then sort of don't talk, at, they talk with each other anymore. That's sort of the implication. The idea is that language change over time, you have a speech community, as long as they are together, the changes will be the same. These people move up the mountain, these people move across the river, they no longer talk to each other and the changes will then be different. And as, as scientists later on, we find that these are the differences between these two languages. The problem with that is language contact. So what happens if pe people, even if they do move, still continue talking to each other? You know, you write letters to your aunt and you visit for family gatherings. That it's really hard to model that in the family tree. Now, the wave theory was conceived as an alternative to that. <coughs> it, it argues that innovation at the center of gravity, you know, a geographic one, a social one, a political one, and then peter out towards the periphery. It's a bit the metaphor people use. It's like, like if you have a, a pond with clear water and you throw stones inside that pond, you have concentric ripples or circles which become less strong the further away from the, from the point of the contact with the stone points. Um, and what you can see there in the graphics, you can see that that allows for overlapping. Here, they, you know, this is the, we have four innovations, but they allow them both to have their own space, but also overlapping space. And that's the hard part, if you like, for the tree. Um, so different features of innovation may overlap, and it's easier to model in this model, language contact and maybe dialect continua, or more broadly, convergence effects. So, these two terms are important. The tree model assumes divergence, language <coughs> more differentiated. Language contact and the wave theory cater more for convergence, that is, languages become more similar to, to language contact. Yes. Ah, then some recent developed recent brackets, you will see why. So, one thing which I think is exciting nowadays, so, well, let me backtrack. What we've seen so far goes back to the 18th century, 19th century, up to maybe the 1950s and 60s. And in a sense, our field is still very much defined by those discourses. But there has been development since, and these are three developments which I think are, are interesting. One is the alignment of linguistic variation on the structural side and the social linguistic side. And that's, that's why the recent is in brackets, so that goes in a sense, goes back to the work by William Leboff in the 1960s as well. Um, but there is more recent work by people like Peter Trotschel, for example, who has, who has a research program called Social Linguistic Topology, where he looks at social determinants of linguistic complexity. So it's, it's a, maybe an oldish idea, but in a newer guise. Um, the other thing which is new, and that's I think quite genuine, is what, what people call big data. And big data, of course, plays a role in wider science discussions. Within, the, within linguistics, big data are not big data in a computational sense. It's still relatively small. But, but for us, there are big data. We have now linguistic databases. There is the, the British National Corpus, which has text and you can do work, work frequency. And there's also a project called Grumbang. It's Lots of universities are involved in that. You see whether, whether you can find it. It's, it's a bunch of people working with descriptive grammars and trying to build a big database of grammatical structures. Um, and the other thing is, people sometimes now use what is called phylogenetic methods of language comparison. That comes from biology, so it's about comparing, uh, comparing genes to the species, but some people use that for comparing languages. And it's, it's very, very computation intensive, so you need a big lab for that. And that's something we, we did <coughs> in the 1960s. Um, and the other thing which is sort of arising is in, is in more is in renowned entry, you know, renewed interest in microvariation. That is not comparing you know, German and Chinese on the big, big you know, typology level, but smaller varieties. So there's the, the subproject <coughs> on Dutch dialect, which I guess is the syntactische Atlas von der Nederlandse Dialekten. Um, there's a, 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 an Italian project, which I think is called AIDA, but I don't you know. Classe Italiano de Dialectico Syntactico. That is the, the Scots dialect. So you can see lots of people work on that stuff. And that's also where our research now fits in on the Bantum of syntactic variation. That's precisely the, you know, the, the inspiration we got is from these sort of projects. Yes, that brings me to Bantu languages. Um, 
uh, map of Africa, Africa, linguistically there are four language phyla, that is big families um, in Africa. So you can see that there on the left, Afro-Asiatic, Nilo Sahara, Niger, Congo, Gulsan. Bantu languages are part of Niger, Congo. There are about 300 to 500 Bantu languages, it depends if it only counts. That's a lot. Um, about 250 million speakers, so about a third of the African population speaks the Bantu language. That's, that's a huge number. Um, spoken in 27 <coughs> different countries. And examples include languages like Swahili, that's probably the, the most well-known Bantu language. Also Zulu in South Africa, Bemba in Zambia, Uganda in Uganda, Chichewa in Malawi. And you can see more the language names there. I've shaded here on the map the, the part of Niger Congo which is Bantu. So the blue shading here, that's Bantu languages. It's geographically, it goes from Nigeria, Cameroon, borderland, in, in where it says, just below where it says Igbo, all the way across the continent to Kenya, and <coughs> south towards South Africa. Um, I should add something a little bit more. That's another map of the Bantu language, now zooming in. The color shading are what is sometimes called zones. There is a, um, a, a, a Bantu language called Malcolm Guthrie, who's now passed away. And he proposed a referential geographic classification of Bantu language. It's not terribly important for us, except I'm going to use the terminology, so I just want to introduce it here. Essentially, what Guthrie says, okay, there are many languages, we need a way to refer to them. He proposed 16 geographic zones, and that's the color shading we have on the map. Seven in the west, nine in the east. Um, and then he had an alphanumerical index from A in the northwest to S in the south, and numbers to refer to these languages. So Swahili in his scheme would be G42. It, you know, it's not, I, I have pictures of that as well. So the little circles are there. You can see the alphabetical thing. Is, it's not the end of the world if you find that disturbing, but it's just later on in my slides, I sometimes use these G42, M14, S13. So that's what it means. You know, I don't think it matters too much. Um, a final note. So this is the Niger Congo language family. So we've seen that Bantu language is spoken very widely in terms of geographic spread. Demographically, geographically, huge language group. In terms of genetic classification, it's a tiny, 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 tiny branch of a much larger family. So there's a real mismatch, if you like, between the, the genetic affiliation of the language group, which is just a small, small subgroup of a much, much larger structure, and the demographic, demographic and geographic spread of the languages. Um, yes. Um, Variation, I'm focusing on Eastern Bantu mainly. It's fairly uniform in broad syntactic parameters. It's sometimes called a linguistic spread zone. There's work by Johanna Nichols and, and Rob Dixon. Um, typical, you know, typical uh, typological features are an elaborate system of noun classes. I'll show that in a moment. Basic subject verb object order, but also pragmatically determined word order. Head marking and complex verbal extensions. But there's a high amount of micro-variation within that broad typological profile. Um, these are noun classes. This is from Swahili. Anybody speak Swahili? We would not guess Swahili. Ah, Safi Very good. Um, anyone else? Mm. It's a nice language to learn if you, if you get a chance. Um, you know. and I, I think there are Swahili classes here, actually. There are? There are? I don't know. You can find out. Um, so this is, these are a bunch of Swahili nouns. Um, so you can see the word for person, the word for guest, the word for tree, mountain. Um, and what, what is interesting is that each of these nouns belongs to what is called a noun class, which is essentially it's like grammatical gender. So as a speaker of French, you have to know whether a noun is either masculine or feminine. If you don't know that, your morphology will be wrong, because there's different articles and different agreements. That's the same here, except for rather than two or three genders, there are you know, 11, the way I counted here. So many more genders. Uh, but you have to learn it because it's part of the, of the lexic specification of the noun. So, what I call the class 1, 2 has a prefix m, mm, m2, mm and the same for the Esmigeli. The suffix, the, sorry, the plural of that has the prefix wa. So it's very regular. m2, wa2, mgeni, wa geni. That gives you class 1 and 2 as I call it here. It's mainly humans, it's reserved for, for you know, you know, higher animals. Class 3, 4 has. The class three also has a m mm prefix, but then the plural is mi. So mti, miti, or mlima, mountain, milima. Um, actually, the mlima is in Kilimanjaro, like the big mountain in Tanzania, Kenya. It, that's, it's the root for that. Um, class five, the jicho, the eye, macho, the eyes, jibel stone, marble stones. 
Kitabu, it's, that's a loan word from Arabic. If, if, you, if I remember Arabic, Kitabu is a very standard medium writing word. Um, but it's completely integrated into the clown class system. So, one book, Kitabu, many books, Vitabu, Kitanda, Vitanda. Class 9, 10 doesn't distinguish in the, in the normal morphology in the classes, but you can see it, I don't have it, you can see it in the agreement system. If you have one drum and two drums, the forms will be slightly different. Um, so that's in Goma. And Goma and Safari, Safari, that's loaded as well. And then finally, it, you know, class 11 only has you know, one class, Ukuta. It's either because there is no plural, so Uzuri, the beauty, doesn't have a plural. Some of the plurals of class 11 goes into class 10. So it would be you know, Ukuta wall, and then it would be Nukuta, the walls. Um, that's why he, there's variation in Bantu in terms of how many classes are there. So here we have 11. Other languages have 9, other have 16. The pairing of the classes, here I've done very neatly 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but there's variation there. And then also the agreement property. So that is what we have in French or German. If you have an adjective of a verb, you have, or a verb, you have to know which noun class you use, and then the verb and the adjective will be looking slightly different. Um, okay, noun class is the second example I have in terms of typological profile. That's the word order. Basically, it's subject, verb, object, but there is lots of word order change. And one example I have is called locative inversion, which again is actually there's a good part to Romance languages as well. So this is from Chichewa, a language spoken in Malawi and Zambia. Uh, example one means those visitors came to the village, Alendowo, that's the subject, it actually agrees, you can see the two means it agrees in class two with the A on the verb. So Ana, Buera, Na is a tense marker, so the A is the agreement marker. And then I don't have an object, I have a locative complement here because I want to do the inversion, but that comes after the verb. But what you can also say is rather than alendo wana buera kumuzi, you can also invert that and say kumuzi kuna buera alendo wo. So you invert the locative and the agent. Mm -hmm. Yes? And it's interesting because the agreement here now is with the locative. So it's not just a fronted locative, which you could also do. But this is really the locative here is coded as a subject. It's a really fascinating construction because you wonder, you know, what is the status now of this agent here? Is it an object or is it an adjunct? Can you leave it? What is the prosody? Lots of studies. Um, but it's a very common construction. And the pragmatics of that is, is often a presentational focus construction, presenting something new. So this is a little bit like if you have on a, on a platform in a train station, on, on platform 7 arrives the express to London. And it's the express to London which is the important new information. So this is what the example in 2 does. Um, variation on that, so this is what I've seen here, what, what I've shown is locative inversion. There's also instrument inversion, relation inversion. And there's differences in different languages. Um, and then the final example I have, it's a complex verbal extension, just to, to illustrate that a little bit. From Swahili, the word for, for to close something, like to close a door, is funga. If you close for someone, it's fungia, sometimes called an applicative. To open, that is the, the opposite of closing, opening, fungua. And then a passive funguliwa, be open. Um, the word in Herero, Namibia, to wash, Koha, wash intensely, kohohora, wash again, repetitively, kohohora, and then finally, in Sumwa, a small language from Tanzania, dima is to herd this into herd cattle, and dimelizia is to herd for payment, herding cattle professionally, getting a salary for it. And that, you know, it's quite regular, so any activity you can do, you can add the suffix that it means doing it for payment. Um, so you can see that it's a complex system. We have variation in Bantu, the number of extensions, what kind of extensions there are, and the meaning of those extensions. Yeah, so broad typological similarity, but then differences in the detail micro variation. Um, and that brings me to the database. Um, what we've done over the last couple of years, we tried to collect data on this variation. We have a database at the moment with about 50 languages, and um, 35 languages of that have 80% or more data points, so we are you know, more certain about the results we derive. We compare systematically 142 morphosyntactic features or parameters. Um, so it's very, it's both restricted but also quite structured. Um, report function includes a single parameter report, a language report, and also shared similarity between groups of languages. I'll show a little bit more of that in a moment. 
Um, we can calculate similarity between all language patterns. And we can calculate an average of shared parameters for each language with respect to the whole group. Um, we can look at co-variation of different parameters. Um, and we can correlate with geographical space. I, you know, the relevant bits I'll show them in a moment just now. Um, I just give you screenshots. This is the what we call the parameter list. So you, you know, I won't go into detail. But what this does is it asks, for example, in one, the shape of the augment. What is the shape of the augment? And then you say either I don't know, there is no augment. It's only a vowel, or it's a vowel and a consonant shape, or it's an expressed tonally. The details don't matter, but we have 142 questions like that about the structure of a given language, and then get answers. And these values feed the data. Yeah, you okay with that? Okay. Um, of these parameters, there's 12 different subgroups. There's, you know, half of them about nominal verbal morphosyntax. The other half, or a bit less than half, about clausal morphosyntax. Um, so it's the example we just seen for the noun classes that would be under nouns and pronouns. For the for the locative inversion, that would be under constituent order. And for the derivation suffixes, that would be under verbal derivation. Uh, this is a screenshot. This is what it looks like. So you can click on different things. So you know, um, you have the report function here with three different functions: the language report, language set report, or parameters matched by language pair. This is a list of languages, and it goes on much further. So there's you know many more languages than we have data for really. Um, this is an example of a um, hmm. Ah, of a language. Sorry, I think I have to <laughs> collect myself a little bit. Um, so this is the language G52. So this is the little code I explained earlier, uh, which is it's a language called Chindamba in Tanzania. Um, and it's a particular um, parameter group in particles, and then you get this report. So this is parameter number, what is the parameter? And these are the values, so these are really the interesting data here, 4, 3, and A, and this is how we build the database. Um, this is, you can't even see, but you can see it get much bigger once we increase the number of languages we're looking at. Um, this one I have more about later, but as a starter, this is, the best analogy is actually, it's a distance table, which sometimes you still find if you have like a road map. If you want to know how long it takes to go from Ghent to Brussels, you have like you know, a list of Belgian cities here, the list of Belgian cities here, and you can read the distance, you know, in, in that matrix. Yeah, this is roughly how it works. Like so, on the um, on the left hand side, this is these are languages, language names. These are language names, and I can by going by finding the point where they meet, I can look at not the the kilometer distance, or we could do that as well actually, but but the similarity in some sort of structure. So this is what that tells us. Um, and this is just to show there's a map function, so we can project different different results on, on the map. <coughs> okay, now I want to use all that to compare East African languages. We are we've seen that this is an African language map. This is East Africa, where we are. We are happy with that. These are the languages. I won't go into too much detail. You can see most of them are from Tanzania, Kenya, but we also have Uganda, uh, the DRC. We have Mozambique down here. I have a map which maybe shows that better. This is the geographic area we are at. Um, and what we've done, we've taken these 90 languages and calculated the similarities. So this is the sort of matrix I've talked about before. Um, you will see that the differences range from 45, that's the lowest amount of similarity, to 80, that's the highest amount of similarity. What this means is in terms of morphosyntactic features, this is what they share. So the lowest is between N44 and E51, which is um, between Sena in the south and Kikuyu in the north, and 80 is between two Mozambican languages. Yes, and that's what it says here. Overall values go from 45% to 80%. And um, what I want to do with that, I want to identify languages with 70% or more similarity. It's in part arbitrary, but you'll see that in the moment. I use that because it gives us three groups, a northern group, a central group, and a southern group. And I want to use, use that to correlate that with geographic proximity, but also with lexical classification. Um, so the three groups we have are, this is the first one. It's Kinyole, Runyoro, and Luganda. I have a map just now. It doesn't matter at this stage very much where they are. But you can see that they all share 70 or more similarity. 
Yes, if you go from J11 to E35 at 73, J15 to E35 at 74, and J11 to J15 at 72. So this is a group which is defined by sharing 70% of the normal similarity. The second group I have is this one here, which controls Rombo, Benderangi, and Mbubu. And the third one is just one small group with the 80%, two languages, Makuru and Shabu. If you project that in space, you get a very neat geographic assortment with the northern group, the central group, and the southern group. Yes, you are good with that? Okay. Um, one caveat, there's two other values over 70 which I've ignored here, and you know, we can worry about that later, but for the moment that's fine. Um, the rest of the data, are all, all the other similarity pairs are below 70%, so that is really um, now, what I want to do, I want to compare that with the lexical classification. So this is based on morphosyntax. syntax. Um, there is work by a colleague called Rebecca Golomot, she in 2015, with collaborators also from Ghent actually. She developed a classification of Bantu languages based on 100 word lists and 409 languages. Many more words, many more languages than we have, but a slightly lower um, value number. She has five, or they have five main groups, including the Eastern group, to which all the languages of our sample belong. There is not a 100% match between our languages and their languages, but there is enough overlap to allow comparative observations. And what I want to check now, I want to check for inclusivity. That is, are the members of the structural group part of the lexical group? And exclusivity, there is no other languages of the structural sample in the same group. You'll see that at the moment when I show you the, the figures. Um, this is the classification which Grolmott and I did. So down here, these are language names. You can see it's more, way more detailed than we have. So we ignore, ignore the complexity. But um, I want to now check with the northern group and see how the languages of my northern group, which is the morphosyntactic group, how that projects onto the lexical tree. This is the lexical tree. I look for Runyora and Luganda, and they are here. So they are reasonably close, and they both belong to this group here, which we can identify with this one. Um, I have a little bit of a problem with the third language, Kinyole, because it's not part of the tree. But there's a related language, Luia, which now, for, you know, for, for our purposes, I, I treat as sufficiently similar. That language, Luia, is found here, in this node. So what we see is the three languages of the morphosyntactic group are all part of a fairly small lexical group. So in a sense, they match. So what I want to say is that we have a match between morphosyntactic structure, or morphosyntactic similarity, and lexical similarity <coughs> for these particular languages. Um, for the northern group, the lexical morphosyntactic classic match. All members of the morphosyntactic northern group are the same lexical group, and no other language of the morphosyntactic sample is part of the lexical group. The southern group, only two members, um, and only one of them is actually included here in, this, in the database. So Makua is there, Chwabu isn't, but work by actually Rosen Gewa, who is sitting over there, has shown that Chwabu and Makua are lexically similar. So I assume that's fine, they are the same group. This is where Makua is. What is more interesting about the southern group is that there is another language which could be there, but isn't. Um, Yao is close, spoken very closely to Makua and Shwabo, but it's not included either in the lexical nor the structure subgroup. So this is where Yao is. And you can see this is Makua is part of this larger group, Yao is part of the one to the right. So there are two lexical groups, and that, that is consistent with our findings on the morphosyntactic group. So for the southern group, lexical structure classification can just be said to match. Assuming that Schwab and Makua are lexically closely related, their structural similarity is matched, and both the lexical and the structural groupings exclude the neighboring language here. Now, the final one is the interesting one, if you like. The central group doesn't have that match. So, members of the morphosyntactic central group are found in different lexical subgroups, and that's what is shown here. I've, I've, I've slightly mixed and, mixed, mixed and matched on that one, um, but I think that's okay. So, you can see that here, these four languages are spread across the whole tree. So the matching we've seen so far doesn't work at all. So in terms of, if you like, inclusivity, this is not a good match. And the other problem we have is that other languages of the sample, not part of the central group, are interspersed between the members of the central group. So these red languages here are within the lexical tree, you know, 
going between the blue arrows, but they are different in terms of morphosyntactic syntactic structure. So what we have here for the center group, the lexical morphosyntactic classification do not match. Members of the morphosyntactic center group are found in different lexical subgroups, and other languages of the morphosyntactic sample are interspersed between members of the center group. So the match fails on both inclusivity and exclusivity. So what that means is member of the northern and southern groups belong to the same lexical group. However, the central group is not consistent with any other lexical group. So that means that structured lexical genetic relatedness differ and so presumably result from different underlying dynamics. So how can the same group of languages result in two different groupings? If you think of it historically, it doesn't make sense because there aren't parallel histories. If you think of an historic explanation, either these people were you know, one speaker group and together, or they were not, but they can't be both. So, in the last couple of minutes, I want to spend on asking the questions, what is the reason for that? And, you know, it could be chance, typological universal constraints, but I'm particularly keen on the differences between lexic and structure in language change. Um, and this is where I come to the final remarks, and th th up to now, I think I'm quite confident about the results. There's lots of methodological issues we can address, but I think this is solid. Now it becomes a bit more speculative. So I, I think it's interesting, but this is more like ideas. Um, so the question is, how can the same group of language result in two different groupings? I said that there's no parallel histories. Uh, we have a situation of divergence and convergence, and that goes back to the discussion we had earlier about trees and circles. In a divergent model, languages develop apart. Speaker communities divide and you get a tree model relation like this. <coughs> Under convergent language become more similar. That way speaker communities meet, talk to each other, and we have language contact and the wave model. So we have two competing models for one reality. But what we have in the central group, and that's slightly different to the previous discussion, we have a difference between lexicon and structure. We have a lexical divergence, so lexically these languages are split apart. apart. But structure convergence, they form a group. So the relevant pictures are here. This is the structure, they converge, it's one solid group. This is the lexical group, and we can see the blue arrows here, they are scattered all over the two this divergence. So one way to think about that is that lexical divergence reflects language as identity markers. This links back to the social, uh, social linguistic explanations for structural diversity. Sometimes people talk about social indexation. Speakers use pronunciation and lexicon words as marker of group identity and social differentiation. We know that there's high sales of pronunciation to assess speakers' identity. I have an example here from Southern Africa. Siswati, the word for three, is tsaf, tsaf, sorry, tsatu. The Zulu word is tatu. Zulu and Siswati are very, very similar. The speakers understand each other perfectly well, but they are very, very keen on that difference and say, that's why Swati is different because they say Tatu just as crazy because we say tatu. And you have a similar thing, although you, need, you can think of examples if you think of you know, Dutch varieties. In, in, in British English, of course, there's a real difference between the vowels R and U. So Southern English love, as in I love you, or you know, come on in love, would come northern Luf. So if you get on a bus in you know, Manchester, Liverpool, people will call you Luf, not love. And that's, that's very iconic, and people are very aware of that. It's very clear. So social differentiation, it, you know, this is social differentiation as much as geographic differentiation. But of course you can continue talking to each other. So the, the Swati Zulu example shows this is, these two languages are completely mutually mutual intelligible. The same, of course, between Southern and Northern languages. It's not that we don't understand the Northerners, it's just they sound funny. Um, structure convergence is very different. That reflects joint language use. So we know there are well known effects of structure alignment in language production. It's unconscious, it's no social indexation, and it's purely driven by the human parser. This is how we can see <coughs> And I have a little example here, and you may disagree with that, but it's, you know, it's simplified. But if somebody asks you, did you give the book to Sally, then chances are you would answer, well, if, if that's true, you would answer, no, I gave the book to Charles, rather than, no, I gave Charles the book. So what I'm playing with here is that in English, there are two ways for double object constructions. One is, you know, give X to someone, or give something, uh, give X something. Um, give John the book or give the book to John. Yeah, the two structures are sort of the same, but if you asked one structure, 
you are more likely to reply using the same structure than the alternative structure. And the, most people, the reason for that most people think is that because you've just processed this particular structure, you just reuse it because it makes your language production easier because you want to speak fast and you know, efficiently. So this is, this is a, a parsing thing. Structure is not a common indicator of social identity. This stuff is, you know, people are not aware of that. So you don't really have dialects saying, oh, you're, you're a double object prepositional dialect. You know, the, people don't really you know, take that for indexation. So structure convergence may indicate continued community practices across socially differentiated groups of speakers. So this is the hypothesis. Um, and this is where we are at the moment, so, you know, that you can now, in a sense, now the work starts, but we haven't done it yet. Um, so, the final remarks are that, that there are different analyses, and they provide different perspectives of a language relationship. So, we've seen lexic differentiation and structural convergence. And what we've seen is that in many cases, our lexic and structural groupings match. But for the central group, where there's a mass mismatch, a possible scenario is that we're, what we're looking at is social differentiation, but continued community of interaction. So we can have both divergence and convergence. And then there are other factors which are likely to play a role, like multilingualism. All these languages are spoken in highly multilingual context. Um, but also effects of language standardization, which I think a lot of the European languages or the comparative that the standardization has played a role. Um, the, the quantitative comparative approach adopted here provides new ways of conceptualizing these different relationships. And if, if you like, it offers new results for students of for studies for historical comparative linguistics, language history, contact, and language universals. And then finally, um, to take that further, I think we need more data for more languages, even though we have quite a bit. Um, we probably need more fine grit application of the methodology we use. Um, we could do that further about where these differences and similarities come from. What are the parameters or structures or values which result in this overall picture? Um, and, of course, we want more detailed analysis of the social historical context in which these variations occur. Um, and then methodologically, you know, there's question of data representation, analysis, interpretation. So the relation between the qualitative and the quantitative analysis I've presented here, that it's probably looking at. Um, there's issues of data, data visualization and geographic representation, which was key to what I'm doing here. Um, and all this needs further doing. Um, but I will have to update you on that at another time. Um, and with that, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Students, questions? This is your chance to talk to about it. Took it off. The bankers can talk to the bankers. I have a question. Uh, okay. um, this looks a lot like a Sprachwort. It, it looks like a Sprachwort. It looks like yes. uh, the Balkans. They have one language structurally, mm -hmm. but uh, yes. on the surface, on the lexical level, it's uh, Albanian Greek uh, yes. separation. Yes. yes, yes. And in an earlier version of that stuff, I, I more explicitly linked to Sprachwort. <laughs> And you know, so it has that, that it, you, know, it, you know, it's also quite reminiscent of the, of the Davidian into the European divide in, in South Asia. Partly, I think, I think what is you know, different here is that we don't really have the crossing of big genetic groupings. That's why I was a bit hesitant. So this is much right. more low level. Right. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, how big that difference is. Um, and the other thing that is quite true, the, so the other thing which we have here is that the, the particular quantitative study, of course, that's different as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, the, you know, the, I mean, it's a Sprachbund language contact type thing. And I'm not sure, to, you know, the, I'm not sure to what extent the, the analysis are presented really, you know, whether it holds up at the end of the day. I wonder whether I've hit too much the social linguistic ground. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but then again, you know, I'm, you know, the other thing I'm not quite sure about, and you know, I should probably talk on it, to what extent people have looked at the social linguistics of Sprachbund. Um, and when the, you know, to what extent that maps on the situation here. Yes. Yeah. Um, can speakers on the border in groups such as Iran and Korea can they understand each other? Can speakers on 
the northern group can they understand each other, or is it still like German and Dutch so different? Like it's not uh, uh, I, so my, my, my impression is that it's not mutually intelligible, so I don't think I don't think speakers could understand each other. Um, I don't think there has actually been good studies of that, so it's slightly you know, intuition. Um, but I think the lexical differentiation is big enough that, that you can't just speak one and the other. Um, but it gets complicated because, of course, these languages are closely related. So, in, in, in a sense, the Dutch, Dutch German example is a good one because if you, if you move away from the standard versions and you go to the dialects, it really gets quite hard to, to draw the line and say, you know, it's, it's hard or not hard to learn it. And of course, for German speakers, it's easier to learn Dutch than for a speaker of Japanese. And you have that system as well, so if you have a multilingual situation, people are exposed, then you probably will pick it up. Um, but in a, in a classic sense, I don't think they are mutually intelligent. That's, yeah. Yeah, I think it's important So this is, it's, it's all parameters? The whole, um, okay. Yeah. Um, and I think if I, hmm, I think these are yeah. all languages where we have 80, 80 plus values. So you don't, if, you, if you go below the 80s, then the results get very quite funny. So in that sense, you know, these are 80 plus languages. What we haven't done, and which we have done a different study, is to subdivide the parameters. And you know, in particular, this slide I showed between, between the normal and verbal morphology and the clausal syntax, that might well be interesting to see whether you get different results from that. Uh, but no, we haven't done that with these data yet. Now you had uh, this uh, in the central group, this uh, like, uh, lexical uh, diversity and structural conversion. Mm -hmm. How about the languages that in your structural uh, classification were around 45% or 50% uh, <coughs> similarity? Could they be lexically very close? Ah! Have you looked into that? I, I'm not systematic. That particular pair, I, I'm pretty certain they are, um, they are not close. Okay. So that, that's, that's the Sena and Kikuyu. Mm -hmm. um, but that's quite true. We haven't done that so yeah, we, yeah. We've, okay. we've come from, this, from the structural side and say, mm -hmm. how does it map? We, what we could do, we could, you know, in a sense it's confusing because this other tree is so big, but you can just reduce that to the languages we have and then map it the other way. Yeah, that's a nice, nice idea. Mm -hmm.